Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by all of our wonderful patrons. If you are a patron, thank you very much for supporting us. And if you are not a patron, please consider joining. And to do so, just head over to patreon.com slash I Know Dino. This week, we have a bunch of dinosaur news, including a new dinosaur with very interesting feet. <laughs> Something we don't talk about all that often. We have some new dinosaur exhibits and new dinosaur video game news. We also have an interview with David Evans from the Royal Ontario Museum. He's published all sorts of dinosaur discoveries over the years, so it's a pretty excellent interview, I think. Of course, we also have a dinosaur of the day, and this week it is Sindosaurus, spelled like Sintosaurus, if you've only seen it written before. But before we get into all of that, we would like to thank some of our patrons who make all of this possible. And this week, we'd like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Trent Carbajal, Stefan, Nutmeg, Taya, Dashiell Hammond, Stego Sophie, Ayumi, Paula Canthus, Lydia, Jackson Crawford, Sorian Brandy, Mayu, and Dino Bo. Yeah, thank you so much. Like Garrett said, we appreciate all of your support and... We hope you're enjoying the perks of being a patron. For anyone who's not yet a patron, if you would like to join, then check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Jumping right into the news, we have a new dinosaur. And thanks to James for sharing it with us on Patreon. It's an article written by Max Cardoso Langer and others and published in Scientific Reports. And it's about a new dinosaur from Cruzario do Oeste, Brazil, and it's named Vespersaurus paranaensis. And Vespersaurus means West Lizard in Latin, and that's because the town Cruzero do Oeste means Western Cross in Portuguese, so they kind of just translated the place name into Latin. And then Paranaensis is after the Brazilian state of Paraná. So it's another city name, lizard, state name, Ensis, <laughs> that we see all the time. And I think they really should have named it after its interesting feet because it made some headlines because of its really interesting feet. But the dinosaur name, you would never know that it's something interesting. So Vespersaurus is from the early late Cretaceous, as they put it. And from my translation, it's roughly 80 to 90 million years ago, which is technically the early part of the late Cretaceous. And they found nine vertebrae, hip bones, and most importantly, part of a foot, which they named to the holotype. However, they're not entirely sure if all the bones came from the same individual. It's just kind of assumed because there aren't any duplicate bones in that set, and they're in close proximity. So they find them in kind of the same area, about the same size. Sure, same dinosaur. (laughs) And the bones also seem like they all have characteristics of noasaurs, which are the group that they put it into. They also found a bunch of pterosaur bones jumbled in with Vespersaurus. That must have been a fun puzzle. Yeah, fun. Could be. (laughs) If you're into piecing through things like this. Fortunately, I think pterosaurs are different enough that it shouldn't have been too difficult. Rather than, you know, if you have multiple types of ceratopsians in the same bone bed, it might be a little more difficult. I think it's kind of fun to think about what was going on that a pterosaur ended up getting jumbled up with a noasaur. True. Like, that's, there's got to be a good story there, but we might not ever know it, unfortunately. So, like I said, Vespersaurus is a noasaurid, and it's not a group we talk about all that much. Noasauridae, as a quick refresher, is the group that includes two dinosaurs that we covered years ago, including Elaphrosaurus and Mashikasaurus, which are both small, lightly built probable carnivores. And there have been reports of noasaurids all over Gondwana, with the best finds coming from Madagascar, which is where Mashikasaurus is, and Argentina, which both used to be connected to Africa. Although by the late Cretaceous, when we see these noasaurines, South America was starting to separate from Africa. So there might be some diversification happening, especially with Vespersaurus, which was on South America. In addition to the bones that were already mentioned, they found more bones that they think are also Vesperosaurus, and they know that at least some of the bones aren't from the same individual, so then they end up being in a paratype. And those bones include a bundle of other vertebrae, shoulder blades, arm bones, 
a partial hand, more hip bones, foot bones, a tooth, and a single skull bone, which is the left frontal. We talk about frontals a lot. <laughs> I guess they fossilize better than some of the other bones. The really cool thing about Vespersaurus, though, is its foot, because it basically just walked on one toe of the foot. Very weird. Yeah, and you might have noticed we had a tweet about it, and there were a couple places that talked about it briefly in the news, so you might have seen this weird one-toed dinosaur. And superficially, if you look at its foot, it looks like a pretty typical theropod three-toed foot, but the middle toe was much bigger than the twos on the sides, and the side toes had much thinner blade-like, as they call them, claws. So it's starting to look a little bit more different. And in fact, the side toes were so short that they may have barely touched the ground at all, <laughs> which would have made it, quote, effectively monodactyl, end quote. Weird. Yeah, the pictures, it's hard to tell if it could have touched the ground at all, but you can definitely see the long toe. Yes, but just looking at the foot, you might not think that it would have just walked on one toe, but theropods basically walk on their tiptoes. They don't walk with, you know, their digitigrades we were talking about the other week. So because of that, even though the toes are decently long, the two side toes, for lack of a better term, the middle toe is much longer. And really, since part of the toe would be up in the air, that part of the toe lines up with the two shorter toes. Oh, yeah. So the part of the middle toe that's up in the air might mean that the other two toes were up in the air completely, whereas just the tip of that middle toe is on the ground. And on our Discord server, we talked a little bit about how horses are like that, and they basically just walk on one toe, and we have this evolution of horse feet, and it kind of looks like Vespersaurus, where at one point they had three toes and like two short toes kind of next to the hoof hmm. growing out in the middle. It's kind of fun. So if you're a patron, you should definitely check that out. So it's possible if Vespersaurus had kept going and evolving, it could have eventually evolved into a hoof? I guess it's anything is possible. True. <laughs> but I don't know if it would have been advantageous to have a hoof instead of the, oh, claws. the toe that yep. it has. Yeah. And plus, it's a lot lighter weight than a horse. So I don't mm. know if it would have benefited from a hoof because the toes also make them a little quieter and sneakier oh, since we true. think this was probably a carnivore. And supporting the idea that Vespersaurus may have been effectively monodactyl is a series of tracks that have been found in the area. And by the area, I basically mean South America. There was one, I think, 50 kilometers away from this site, which is sort of near Sao Paulo in Brazil. And it was basically a monodactyl dinosaur track that they had seen before. And they're like, this is super weird. <laughs> we don't know of any monodactyl dinosaurs, but it kind of looks like that's happening with this track. And to me, I'm kind of surprised that anyone even noticed that because when I see dinosaur tracks, they stand out when they do stand out because there are three toes and you you can see the outline of the three toes and you think, okay, yeah, I can see where that dinosaur track is. Sometimes they're pretty faint, but in general, at least there's that three-toed signature. But if it's just one toe, there are tons of little divots and rocks all over the place. Spotting that as a lay person seems like it would be very difficult. So I wonder if there are more of these around, but just the general public doesn't notice it and then point it out to paleontologists because who's going to notice a single toe print? It's basically indistinguishable from just a gouge in the ground. And interestingly, there are also potentially monodactyl tracks from Argentina, which are from way back in the Jurassic, which means that there might have been dinosaurs walking on one toe for most of the age of the dinosaurs. Weird. I wonder what the advantage would be. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess... The way I think about it is we've got dromaeosaurs that walk on two toes and they have interesting tracks because they have that one claw sticking up off the ground that everybody knows about with Velociraptor and everything. And we think that they did that so they could keep that claw sharp. And we can tell by the shape of these claws that they're narrower and that could potentially mean that they were trying to keep them sharper and more blade-like. So maybe Vespersaurus is kind of like a Velociraptor that has two clawed toes that it keeps off the ground. But instead of being a toe on the end and leaving two off to the side to walk on, this one has claws on either side <laughs> of a walking digit. But it seems weird because if it was going to actually use those claws to dig into something, it would have to get that middle, much bigger toe out of the way. 
It's like, is it flexible enough to bend down and then have the other two sticking forward? Probably, although that doesn't seem like the ideal way <laughs> to use, you know, slashing claws. Right. And I should also point out, even though it's probably obvious at this point, this isn't a large dinosaur. Noasaurids are definitely on the small side, and they estimate that this one was, quote, just over one meter long, end quote, which puts it right around three feet so that's a very short dinosaur. That's on like the very, very small scale of dinosaurs that don't basically fly. Although these are theropods, so maybe they had feathers too. Made it a little bit more bird-like. So now we have a new dinosaur, and it's weird in an all-new way, <laughs> as tends to happen over time, in that it just walks on one toe on each foot, most likely. And it may not have even been the only one. Yeah, and they might have been around for like 70 million years and we still need to find all these, this whole lineage of dinosaurs with just one main toe for walking on and a couple of side claws. It does seem like it'd be harder to balance, especially bipedal, because the comparison to horses, they're quadrupedal, so they have a little more help. <laughs> it's hard to imagine our toes are not built that way. Yeah. Next step is a dinosaur robot shaped like this with one big toe so that we can see how they walked. Next in the news, the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University in Philadelphia got a new Dinosaurs Around the World exhibit at the end of June, and it shows how dinosaurs made it around the world and how they adapted. The exhibit runs until January 20 of 2020, so you've got plenty of time to see it. And you can see Spinosaurus, Amargosaurus, T-Rex, Protoceratops, Velociraptor, and more. These dinosaurs, they were on the news, too, as they were being transported by truck from New Jersey. Like, oh, look, a Spinosaurus on the bridge, and <laughs> things like that. Getting around the world, just like the exhibit. True, true. <laughs> Although, spoiler alert, the way that they got around the world back then was most of the continents were still connected. When they walked, there were no trucks. Yeah. And they swam. True. Another way. Or flew. Yeah. So there you go. Now you don't have to go to the museum if you're not in Philadelphia. Oh, well, it still sounds cool. <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> In Edinburgh, Scotland, there are animatronic dinosaurs at West Lothian Shopping Center from now until August 16th. And if you go there, you can see T-Rex and Spinosaurus, as well as Brachiosaurus and Triceratops, and walk a dinosaur trail and participate in dinosaur-themed competitions, though I couldn't figure out what kind of competitions there are. In Illinois, the Peroria Riverfront Museum is planning a new dinosaur exhibit for the summer of 2021, and it's called T-Rex, the Ultimate Predator. It's actually the same exhibit currently on display at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and that's going to be there till August 2020, so you have two chances. Nice. AM&H makes some pretty cool exhibits. Mm -hmm. And they do often travel when they're done with them, which is nice, because then we get to see them too sometimes. Yeah. Even though we don't live anywhere near AM&H. Yeah, uh, well, well, that's a good reason to go visit. Yeah, a little pricey though. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, we can. <laughs> Next, we've got some game news. So the massive multiplayer online MMO game RuneScape is getting an update. It's called The Land Out of Time, and it's going to have an island with dinosaurs and temple ruins. It's a free expansion. It came out July 8th. So I say getting an update because we're recording early, but by the time this comes out, it's out. <laughs> <laughs> On the island, you can trap large dinosaurs, and the dinosaur designs, they're a blend of dinosaurs and insects. So, for example, there's a T-Rex butterfly mix, which looks pretty cool. I don't even know where to start with that. They're barely related. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might as well have a T-Rex tree mix. It's pretty. Apex Legends 2 recently shared a new character and map changes to the game, which includes dangerous dinosaurs. The season came out July 2nd. I've only had a chance to see the trailer so far, so it's hard to tell any specifics. But if anyone has played it, let us know what you think. Yeah, tell us about the dinosaurs in it. <laughs> and last, Jurassic World Alive has an update where you can feed and play with your dinosaurs in new what they call sanctuaries. So you can give raptors toys to play with and mm. you can feed your dinosaurs goats, <laughs> just like the movie. <laughs> You could also share your sanctuaries and take care of your friend's dinosaurs, so see how they've set it up. Like a little miniature park builder type setup? Mm hmm but in AR, augmented reality. Oh, that's pretty cool, yeah. Mm hmm And now for our interview with David Evans. Just a quick reminder that if you're a patron, then you can hear our exclusive bonus content. Our interviews often run long, and we edit it so that the podcast isn't too long, but... Hmm. 
If you want to hear everything that he has to say, we had a really great conversation with him. We did. Yeah. We kept him there way too long. Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> we lost track of time until we were. everybody was so hungry that we could not go on any longer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you want to hear all the things that we talked about, then go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash inodino. And we're going to post some pictures, too, that we took on our Discord server. So if you're a patron, then definitely check out Discord so you can see some of the pictures of stuff that David showed us at the ROM behind the scenes, which was really cool to see. We are joined today by David Evans. We're actually in his office at the Royal Ontario Museum. And you probably know who David Evans is because he's a prolific researcher. But in case you're not, he's an associate professor at the University of Toronto, and he's the curator of dinosaurs at the Royal Ontario Museum, also known as the ROM. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. So before we get into Zool, because once we start talking about Zool, I know I'm not going to want to talk about anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you a little bit about some of the hadrosaurs you've worked with. Sure. So you were just on the Gobi Hadros description. Yeah. How many individuals are there in the description? Because it, it kind of vaguely mentions multiples. Uh, the description focuses on two individuals. Uh, it focuses on the one individual that has that beautiful articulated skull, so that where everything is there in life position. And then there's a second individual which has a skull that's in pieces. Uh, it's from a less mature individual, but it has a complete skeleton. I mean, basically every single bone um, that's remarkably preserved, undistorted. And uh, with that white color bone, I mean, it really looks like the animal just died yesterday. Wow. So it was a real pleasure to help Sok Batar get that project across the finish line. And uh, I mean, a really exciting specimen for hadrosaur researchers because it's the first time we have a late Cretaceous hadrosauroid that's not a hadrosaurid from Asia that we actually have a full skeleton. So we actually know the proportions, how many vertebrae they had, uh, how big the hind limbs were relative to the forelimbs and so on. So it's quite an important fossil for helping us register all these, all this bone bed material, isolated bits and pieces that are out there. That almost seems to be your thing more than whatever kind of dinosaurs you specialize. It's whatever you study. They all tend to be really well preserved <laughs> and like have so many details that we can learn all kinds of new things. <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. I mean, I've been lucky certainly to work on some like completely spectacular fossils. And Zool is a really good example. Tip of the nose, the tip of the tail, all the bones there, all the armor and then the skin on top of that. I mean, it's super special. But actually, a lot of the material I work with, I sort of think of myself as working with a, a lot of isolated bones because a lot of the new dinosaurs that I've named, Gobi, Hadros, and Zool notwithstanding, um, have, have actually been on basically isolated bones or bone bed material. So animals like Akiroraptor, the mm -hmm. raptor that lived with T-Rex, uh, is known from just a single jo upper jawbone, beautifully preserved, no less, but just a <laughs> single bone. Yeah, for Gobi Hadros, that was another thing I wanted to ask you. Was it unusually small, do you think, for a hadrosauroid? Or do you think we just find less of the smaller ones? Yeah, the uh, these non-hadrosaurid hadrosauroids, so leading up to the you know famous hadrosaurid family, they actually are not that big. So Gobi hadros is, you know, it's about the size that's it's typical of these like Bactrosaurus, Gilmorosaurus, uh, Levnesovia sort of grade of dinosaurs, Telmatosaurus, Tethyadros. They're, they're, none of those animals are as big as the hadrosaurs that we sort of see in North American museums. So Gobi hadros isn't far off in terms of body size of where we would expect it for where it is in its part of the duckbill dinosaur family tree. The one skeleton we did describe is probably a, immature, but since that description, which took a little while to get out because it's such a monster paper. Sock Batar's crew has found another complete skeleton of yeah. an adult, which isn't much bigger than uh, the material we described in the paper, I understand, but I, I haven't actually seen it. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's so cool that now you have not only one fully complete one, but you're finding more of them. Yeah. That's, that's really great. You also worked quite a bit on Edmontosaurus. Yeah. And recently I saw you were on a paper for UCMP 128181. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> wow, specimen numbers. This is great. Yes, yeah. um, <laughs> you talk, talk, talk with me on my, my level. No, um, <laughs> yeah, th I, that was fun. I, you know, my, my background, I started working with hadrosaurs in Alberta when I was a teenager, actually. Got really lucky to to basically grow up with at the Tyrell Museum and all the guys from Phil Curry and and Don Brinkman and Dave Eberth and Michael Ryan. They all sort of took me under their wing uh, when I was 
young and I got to get into research early. And um, at that time, there actually just weren't that many people working on dinosaurs, believe it or not. And I'm not even that old. You know, this is only 20 <laughs> years ago. And uh, Don, I was going through my undergrad and uh, I needed a project, a research project for my undergrad thesis. And I will always remember it. Don's just like, yeah, yeah, we uh, we collected a hadrosaur skull down on the South Saskatchewan River. Um, looks like it's a, a juvenile. Nobody's been working on hadrosaurs here for years. Why don't you work on them? <laughs> and he gave me the skull of a juvenile Crithosaurus. And that led to my PhD thesis on um, on crested duckbill dinosaurs and their diversity and evolution and, you know, what the heck was that crest for? So I worked a little bit on that problem. And then that segued into just looking at the evolution of duckbill dinosaurs uh, more generally and their their diversity. And so one of my very first PhD students, Nick Campione, um, he tried to untie this knot, which was every researcher who was working on hadrosaurs at the time knew it was a big problem. But uh, it was just too big of a project to take to take on unless it was part of a thesis. And so that was trying to figure out how many species of Inmontosaurus there were. Is Anatotitan valid? Is Thespesius valid? Is Edmontosaurus Saskatchewanensis valid? And what distribution do they have? Are mm -hmm. there multiple species at the time? There's multiple species that were recorded from Alberta and the Horseshoe Canyon Formation and multiple species that were recorded from the Hell Creek Formation. And it gave just, just really unusual distributions where you had multiple very similar looking species around for about six or seven million years. And so he went around uh, and I went with him and we measured basically every Amontosaurus skull on the planet. And uh, we did a bunch of mathematical models of growth and so on. And we reduced the number of uh, Edmontosaur species to two valid ones. Uh, and Montosaurus regalis from the Horseshoe Canyon Formation lives or lived around 71 million years ago. And then in Montosaurus anectens, which lived in the Hell Creek with the famous T-Rex. Um, this allowed us to put growth series together for these animals mm -hmm. uh, for the first time. But like so many growth series, um, even though we had good representation of sort of like the teenagers and the adults and even the old, old ones like Anatotitan, we're still missing for a lot of these species, the really small end of the size spectrum. Mm. And with the Hell Creek, you know, when you sort of take a broad view for Edmontosaurus and Nectens, there are just not a lot of baby dinosaurs known from the Hell Creek at all. And there was a wonderful paper published by uh, Jack Horner and Mark Goodwin and Nathan Mirvold with their big dinosaur census showing that the, the skeletons that people find are really strongly sized biased towards the big ones. And so that's why that specimen from the uh, Berkeley collection was just so interesting and important. Uh, it was a specimen that was found by Harley Garbani, another, you know, world famous fossil hunters, found all sorts of great things, Tyrannosaurus rex, and he found the baby Triceratops as well that Mark Goodwin described. And he also found this almost complete skeleton, just basically missing the head and the end of the tail of a uh, juvenile, a very small juvenile, actually uh, probably a, a large nestling of uh, Imontosaurus nectens in the Hell Creek. So this is one of the rare occurrences of a, of a nestling dinosaur in the Hell Creek, very rare in fact. And uh, my other graduate student who just graduated, Matt Wasik, he described the specimen with me and Mark Goodwin. And then we did some more math to look at how Imontosaurus grew and whether it changed uh, how it walked uh, and how it stood its gait through its growth, whether it was more towards bipedality and walked on two legs mm -hmm. uh, and then transitioned to four legs as it got heavier. And that's been proposed. But we did the first study that actually looked at the lengths of the limbs and compared them. And it turns out that the the baby dinosaurs basically have the same proportions of the forelimb to hind limb. And they were perfectly capable of walking just like an adult on all four legs. We still have some work to do to test that further. But that's why that specimen was so important. It was a really nice single individual of a little small hadrosaur that we could use to look at the biology of how these dinosaurs grew. Right. And then I want to ask, because you just showed us the original Parasaurolophus skull, and we talked a little bit about what they use their crest for. Could you share what you think the best yeah. use case of a crest you think is? Yeah, I told you like sort of the big long story about the history of ideas related to these crests. But my thesis was was looking at the evolution of these crested dinosaurs. And part of that was looking at the function of the crest. And uh, it's it was neat to contribute 
to uh, the progression of ideas and to test some hypotheses or some real legends in the field like John Ostrom and Loris Russell and Dave Weisample. And uh, Dave Weisample did his master's here at the University of Toronto. And not unlike me, his graduate work focused on these this great uh, collection of crested duckbills that we have here. We have uh, over 40 skulls here at the ROM. It's a great place if you like flamboyant duckbills. <laughs> and uh, Dave Weisample, his master's thesis, the work that came out of it really popularized an idea from a uh, German scientist, Carl Wiemann, in 19, around 1930, that these crests, they looked like trombones, and therefore they must have been used like a trombone, basically, <laughs> um, to modify uh, vocalizations and to communicate with other members of their own species. And uh, to come up with that idea, um, Wiemann used the skull of Parasaurolophus. And this is basically a dinosaur duckbill that um, has a reasonably typical face for a duckbill. It's pretty short, uh, but still a reasonably typical face, very typical teeth. And uh, you basically just stuck a trombone on the back of the skull. So the skull is over six feet long or thereabouts when you account for um, the tip of the nose to the tip of the crest. And um, inside that long tubular crest is basically the nasal passages of the dinosaur. So when they would breathe through their nose, the air would loop up, go all the way to the back of the crest, loop back forward before dropping in uh, to the throat and going into the lungs. So this was, of course, really puzzling. And, and the first dinosaurs where this feature was realized were these duckbills from Alberta. And the specimen that Weemon looked at was from uh, the San Juan Basin of New Mexico. But the biggest and best collection is from Alberta. But since then, there's been a number of other hypotheses that have sort of come about uh, that these were used as like literally like snorkels in Paris for all of us. <laughs> so they could dip their head underwater and the crest would stick straight up. Problem is there's not a nostril at the end of the crest, so <laughs> that doesn't work. So that was realized. And then that idea was modified by, by Charlie Sternberg, who said, well, they're still big reservoirs of air. So maybe they basically were like scuba tanks, essentially, <laughs> that when these animals are underwater, they could draw air from uh, from their crest. So it would increase the amount of, of time they could spend underwater. Well, if you just quickly do the calculation of how big the lungs were even at like the smallest possible size and how much air would be in those tubes, it was like a percent. Like It was just like <laughs> nothing. It wouldn't have helped at all. Probably the most famous one, and this is where I got to contribute, was that John Ostrom in the 1960s came around and said, well, if these are big noses. What do we use our nose for? <laughs> well, smelling. And he hypothesized that the crest evolved primarily to increase the tissues responsible for the sense of smell. And Y sample came along uh, about 20 years later, and uh, he basically did some physical modeling. I showed he actually cut the crest physically of the type specimen of Parasaurolophus, uh, which is kind of horrifying, <laughs> uh, given that we have CT technology today. Yeah. Uh, but he was able to basically reconstruct the diameter of the tubes and the shape of the tubes and basically hypothesize the frequencies at which these dinosaurs could have made these calls, which is pretty cool. And I remember when I was a kid watching these documentaries from the 80s and early 90s, and Dave took what he learned and he basically took PVC pipe, like plumbing pipe, and he made a life-size model of the Parasaurolophus crest. And he was all over these documentaries. He <laughs> painted it like fluorescent orange and green. He was like <laughs> blowing through his makeshift Parasaurolophus crest. And, you know, it was like, Boo, you know, it just <laughs> sounded like this really low visceral humming sound. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, well, you know, we, we can take Wayman's ideas a step further. And this is probably how they sounded. And this is not a bad idea because... These animals, they were probably more or less solitary. They're not found in the big bone beds like in Montosaurus. And uh, these low frequencies don't get disrupted in complex environments like high frequencies do. So these animals were living in these like very lush, heavily vegetated uh, coastal plains. And this might have been a great way for these animals to communicate over long distances mm -hmm. and maybe call to mate. So we were saying, you know, maybe you could sort of in mating season, you could hear this sort of Lamiosaur orchestra, with right. Parasaurolophus and Crithosaurus and Lambiosaurus, all making different frequency calls across the landscape. It would have been pretty neat to be around back then. Yeah. 
Uh, you had mentioned that it's similar to what a moose. Yeah, or what moose do, yeah. yeah. So like moose are they don't live in the big big herds, and they have I'm, they have like relatively low frequency vocalizations as like one potential way to communicate in those types of environments. Um, so when I was a grad student, I got to work on the same set of specimens. I did my grad work here at the University of Toronto under Professor Rice. And um, one of the missing pieces of evidence that we could have used to test these various ideas was the brain. I mean, these are really explicit ideas about how these dinosaurs perceived their world. And the brain is the sensory center of the body. Um, but up until that point, no one had really analyzed the brains of lambiosaurs in detail, mm -hmm. as well as the ears. So I got to reconstruct the uh, olfactory, the sense of smell part of the brain, and I showed that it, it actually reduced in size as the crest evolved. So that's pretty inconsistent with the idea that these crests evolved to assist in increasing their sense of smell. And then I got to model the inner ears and test to see if their ears were tuned to the frequencies that Wise Hample and others had predicted the crest could make, and they could. Mm -hmm. So when you put all of that together, and the fact that these crests, the babies didn't have crests, and they were positively allometric, that allometric growth, and they they matured very late, so they were maximally useful to adults. Mm. That suggests when you put all the evidence together, the best hypothesis remains that you know vocalization was a key driver of the crest as well as uh, the, sig the basic visual signaling as well, since they vary between the different species. Right. Uh, and that was work that I did partly during my undergrad and partly during my, my grad work, and I got to do with Larry Whitmer, which was awesome. So we scanned a bunch of skulls and did these reconstructions, and I did the calculations. And yeah, it was it's cool to be able to sort of have contributed to one of those sort of legendary problems. And really, I just tested other people's ideas, but brought it, I think, into the 21st century. So that was, that was pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, that is awesome. I guess we should talk about Zool also <laughs> <laughs> because it's amazing. So we've talked to Victoria Arbor a little bit about yeah. it. So we know like when she first got involved, but when did you first see Zool? Were you out in the field? Um, yeah, I saw Zool very early on. So Zool was found very close to one of my primary field areas along the Milk River in Southern Alberta, just right along the Montana border. Uh, and it was found in the same rocks that I've worked for almost 20 years now, well, 20 years this summer. So I knew a lot of the collectors that were in the area on the American side. And uh, I was out in the field when Zool was uh, being excavated, doing my field work. And the team, because I knew them, they basically called me almost right away. Uh, so I was down and saw the quarry where Zool was collected, I think about two months after it had come out of the ground. And uh, the quarry is one of the most insane dinosaur quarries <laughs> in the world. It's one of the biggest ones, you know, outside of Dinosaur National Monument and some of the big duck build quarries in uh, in Shandong in China. The team who found and excavated it, they had a like steam shovel, like one of those big excavators that you dig the foundation of your house with. Um, they had one of those, and they dug this quarry 45 days straight with one of these giant wow. earth movers over 120 feet deep. It's about the footprint of a football field. <laughs> um, it's massive. And part of the reason that Zool is so well preserved is how it was found. In fact, as these this team was actually trying to make a big hole to find a Tyrannosaur skeleton that was weathering out of that, that bluff, one of their earth moving machines hit the tail club of Zool. And lucky they were paying attention right. and they caught it right away. Um, they collected all the pieces and they noticed that the texture of the bone was quite unusual and they got right away that it was the tail cup of an ankylosaur. And so, um, you know, that very tip of the tail club, which could have been the skull or could have been the middle of that, you know, wonderfully preserved back of the animal with all the skin, it was just, just the very end of the skeleton. Mm -hmm. And that skeleton was about uh, 30 or 40 feet into the hill <laughs> and under about at least that much of rock. So it would never have been exposed for hundreds or thousands of years by natural processes. Right. And those natural processes that help us find dinosaurs today when we're out in the Badlands are actually really destructive. So we find dinosaurs by prospecting and finding their remains on the surface. 
And that means that they experience the freeze thaw of the winters. They also are very uh, close to the surface and experience the infiltration by plant roots. Mm. And this damages a lot of the more delicate bones, for mm. instance. And it also has the potential really to, to damage those soft tissues that are preserved. And so we have this, it, I mean, it, it really is ideal. None of those processes affected Zool. It was found basically just as it was preserved as a fossil 76 million years ago. And um, I think this is part of the reason why the skin in particular is so beautifully preserved. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So was that when you saw how well preserved it was? Was that the moment when you were like, I need this in my museum? Uh, yeah. So <laughs> um, when I saw it that summer, the first summer it was found in 2014, I knew right away that this is one of the most spectacular dinosaurs that had ever been found. Um, and that it was extremely significant. And chylosaurs, even though they're popularly very well known, what a lot of people don't realize because you see them everywhere um, is that they're actually really rare dinosaurs. Where those tail clubbed ankylosaurs occur, they only form about 5% of the dinosaur fossils in those assemblages. And there are far fewer decent, complete specimens in fact, ankylosaurs are largely known from isolated osteoderms and teeth, as well as isolated skulls and tail clubs. Mm -hmm. Zool was actually the first tail clubbed armored dinosaur to be found with a complete skull and a complete tail club. Wow. Which is pretty amazing considering how, you know, well known these dinosaurs are, or, you know, you might think how well known they would be. Mm -hmm. So right there, I mean, we basically have from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail complete. And then all of the osteoderms on top of that, which are formed in the skin. So they're in soft tissue, which typically rots away very quickly, especially in these humid environments. Those typically are lost to most ankylosaur specimens, or at least are not found as they were in life on, on forming the armor of the animal. So we had all of those bones in place in life. And that is remarkable for ankylosaur. So even if that's all we had, this would still be an outstanding specimen. Um, <laughs> On top of that, we have basically the skin preserved almost over the entire body. And the quality of that skin preservation is amazing. I mean, you can literally see like the growth lines in the keratin. Mm -hmm. So when you add that onto it, this is a next level specimen that is, you know, one in a, a you know, a million, million probably. Mm -hmm. And considering all the work that's been done in places like Alberta, Montana, um, this was something that really had a lot of scientific potential to sort out, you know, some interesting issues in ankylosaur evolution. Uh, and then once we were able to get it back to the museum through a, our strategic acquisitions grants, which are basically philanthropically uh, derived sort of donor uh, driven initiative. Once we got it here, um, that's when I recruited Victoria mm -hmm. to work on the specimen with me. And she sat down, looked at the specimen, we started looking at it together and we realized, well, on top of all of that, it's a brand new species of one of the <laughs> rarest types of ankylosaurs, these sort of like Dioplosaurus, Scolosaurus kind of tail clubbed ankylosaurs. At that point, we had to name it and then sort of the legend <laughs> snowballed from there <laughs> uh, with uh, Victoria proposing Zool. I always liked Zool and Ghostbusters. And, uh, you know, the resemblance, I think, is pretty much uncanny. I mean, it's all mm -hmm. there. The big nostrils facing forward, the wrinkly forehead, the big horns <laughs> swept back behind the eyes. I mean, the only thing our Zool is missing from, you know, a hypothesized Zool skull from the movie Monster is the big fangs. And that's because, of course, Zool is a plant eater, <laughs> the dinosaur Zool. So, so the um, name came very easily. It did. Yeah, it did. It was one of those ones where it's like, yeah, it looks just like Zool. Um, <laughs> so that was great. And so we had fun with that first part of the name. Uh, and the second part of the name, we put our scientist hats on and, <laughs> and we went with Kuravastator. It's a bit of a tongue twister, but it means destroyer shins in reference to that amazingly mm -hmm. preserved tail club. And the tail club is also really special. It has all of the osteoderms preserved from the base all the way to the end of that tail club knob. And uh, what sets Zool apart from other ankylosaurs, some details of the skull, but those spikes that run all the way down the tail give this tail, the tail a wicked like sawtoothed, super spiky, almost like, you know, the, the snout of a sawfish. It's basically like when you put that together with the huge and beautifully preserved tail club, I mean, you've got one of the most wicked weapons ever to evolve. And, mm -hmm. and Zool is certainly the most spiky of all the ankylosaurs. Mm -hmm. So it's a particularly awesome ankylosaur to get to work on. And yeah, we're really lucky that 
we were able to bring it into the museum here and preserve it forever for everybody to see. And and people got so excited about it when we announced the discovery and they loved Zool so much. And I don't think even Victoria and I appreciated just the popularity of Zool as like a cult film icon <laughs> and just how beloved that monster was. And when you, you know, we put it together with this amazing dinosaur, like it, the, the public response was, I mean, it was outstanding. It was like, I've never seen before. And mm -hmm. so we put the uh, exhibit into high gear and um, we got the exhibit open within a year and a half of, uh, of announcing wow. um, the new species. And uh, it's just coming to the end of its run now. So you guys got to see that today. Yeah. Uh, and it's proven to be pretty popular. So it's been a heck of a wild ride, the Zool ride. Right. For me for the last uh, couple of years. But uh, yeah, I got, I got started on it like, from more or less the beginning. But it took me a couple of years to raise the funds to get into the museum. And uh, once we did, it was a real pleasure working with Victoria. I learned a lot from her. And she is absolutely the world's expert in these dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And it was great to have, have her as part of the team. Mm -hmm. Since you're in charge of all the dinosaur exhibits now, do you have any other favorite exhibits in the realm? You know, I, I was involved towards the end of the development of the permanent galleries. And the permanent galleries here are certainly something that we're pretty proud of. The dinosaur collection here was built primarily by Levi Sternberg, so legend in the field. Mm -hmm. And we have one of the biggest and most historically significant collections of dinosaurs. I showed you Parasaurolophus, but there's a lot of holotypes and specimens you've seen in books for years. And our dinosaur gallery is chock full of dinosaurs. Uh, it's one of the biggest in North America and one of the biggest in the world. So, you know, I love, I love just seeing all those classic specimens. But we have another special exhibit up uh, that was linked to the Dino Hunt TV series. And I think it's on Netflix now in the US. And it's an exhibit that's on another new dinosaur that I was involved in, uh, Wendy Ceratops. Nice. And um, it actually is an exhibit about the process of paleontology, how we go about finding new dinosaurs and how we go about naming them, comparing them and naming them when we find that they're distinct from other known species. Uh, and it includes some of the original fossils, including the type frill material of one of the oldest members of the horned dinosaur family mm -hmm. uh, and like a pretty audacious, pretty cool one at that with the big wave of oh, big yeah. droopy hooks. And it's got a fun story too. And we, I, I named it for Wendy Sloboda, who is one of the best fossil hunters on the planet. She has over uh, 3000 specimens to her name at the Royal Terrell Museum. And that is just a very small number of actual fossils. Many of those are, are sites that include many fossils. Wow. She's discovered a lot of the best specimens that are in the Trail Museum collections, and she's discovered a lot of the best specimens that we've been excavating along the Milk River since she started volunteering with us about 15 years ago. And uh, given what she's contributed, um, not just to Alberta paleontology, not just our field camps, but I mean, all those specimens have made a big impact in the science globally it was just natural to recognize her mm -hmm. and she was so excited and for, wendy is a force of nature she's got like dreadlocks and she's completely covered in tattoos and <laughs> i'll never forget when i saw her after the paper came out she jumped out of her truck has dino digger license plate nice on it and she just jumps in, in front of me and she puts out her arm and it's got a tattoo of danielle's reconstruction of wendy ceratops that's the amazing. size of her forearm and she goes I saved this spot for my dinosaur. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I was pretty happy. Both Michael Ryan and I, who, who named it, were pretty happy we got to do that for Wendy because she's made outstanding contributions to, uh, to paleontology. And so it's a bit, of a bit of a whimsical and fun name, but rolls off the tongue pretty easy. So there's oh, yeah. an exhibit about Wendy Ceratops, and you can see the story behind Wendy Ceratops in, that, in the Dino Hunt series, uh, which is on Netflix. Well, speaking of, you created that series. I did, yeah. Well, can you tell us a little bit about your thought process behind? Yeah, sure. Um, that was a really cool, it was just a real cool journey there too. After we had done a successful exhibit called Ultimate Dinosaurs, uh, that was my first major exhibit um, that I developed. And it's actually been touring around, been all over the US. Mm -hmm. it tells a story about the dinosaurs of Gondwana and why they're so different from the ones from North America. And it's sort of that idea that the evolution of the Earth and the Earth's moving tectonic plates mm -hmm. is intimately related to the evolution of life on the planet. It drives life on the planet. So it isolates populations that can go in their own separate directions. Anyways, it was, uh, it was a fun exhibit to do. And um, it was successful. And at that time, um, the History Channel was looking to do a dinosaur series. So 
a production company that they had talked to approached me and said, what do you, what do you want to do? Like, let's, what would you suggest doing? We could do something that's related to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, there's been a lot of documentaries on this stuff, actually. But, uh, you know, what you might not know is that right now we're really in a golden age of dinosaur discovery all around the world. And Canada is actually playing a major role in this a sort of golden age of dinosaur discovery that we're in. And so I said, you know, what would be really cool is why not follow some of us young, younger generation paleontologists to some of these wild areas. You could tie it in with the history and um, you'll see some of these new discoveries being made. And so I pitched this and I wasn't sure how they would take it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came back and they, they said, there's so much here. We're not just going to do one documentary. Why don't we do a documentary series? Wow. Or a four one hour documentaries. And the Wendy Ceratops story is the focus of the first episode. And it's really cool because we knew it was new when we were digging it up. But we still, because it was a bone bed, we had pieces that we we, we wanted to recover. Mm -hmm. So it's just, just a matter of just keeping, you just keep digging and eventually you'll get those bones. So we had the cameras with us when we were digging up Wendy Ceratops and people watching the series are watching us reveal new information about a dinosaur we didn't even know existed that's pretty the exciting year before <laughs> and yeah it was it was a yeah I, I thought it made for a pretty cool show i mean you get to see us being excited because we were literally like oh we don't have a radius yet you know mm -hmm. and where are those horns we need the post orbital horns and it was uh it was cool and and um it, it also yeah get, got lots of great exposure for my Canadian colleagues and the amazing fossil record we have here uh, in Canada and the work that's being being done by uh, by the sort of younger generation of researchers and uh, on top of all that so that was cool we developed a companion website which is pretty typical these days mm -hmm. and then we pitched something really unusual is to have a companion exhibit to the TV series mm -hmm. so we opened the exhibit the day the TV series premiered oh wow. It, it was a lot of work, sure. but talk about like a multi-platform type of production. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually were nominated for like a Canadian Emmy. Oh, wow. Uh, which I had no idea. The production was like, guys, we got uh, nominated for Canadian Screen Award and we can go on the red carpet or whatever. I had never heard of this before. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, you know, you know, that's cool. Uh, whatever. <laughs> and uh, I didn't realize until I talked to some of my friends after that we got nominated, it was nominated for best cross platform presentation mm -hmm. because we had an, a TV show, an exhibit and a digital, right? which is something they had never seen before. And what's interesting in that whole thing is that the creators are the ones who are like the people who are nominated. So I wasn't just like the advisor or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if we would have won, yeah, I, I would not have been there to go and walk up and get <laughs> the award. We didn't win, but it still was cool. I, you know, I when I I never would have thought that I would ever be nominated for like a screen award. When yeah. I was, you know, especially if you're going kid. into paleontology. And yeah. <laughs> so other than coming to the ROM, where should people follow your work? Probably the best place to follow what we do here is um, to follow our social media. So I've got a Twitter account and uh, the University of Toronto Paleo Group has a Twitter account. Of course, so does the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, so that's sort of the best way to keep up with the research that we're doing. And all of the stuff that I've talked about today, I've been a member of big teams and I've got a, a, a great group of graduate students here who are doing all sorts of exciting research um, related to the topics that we've discussed. And they also have social media accounts. I encourage you to follow them. And we've got, yeah, all sorts of new stuff coming out, new horn dinosaurs on the horizon, some new theropods from the Hell Creek and uh, lots more Zool. So uh, it'd be great if uh, people are interested in following along, they could do that. Awesome. Well, thank you very much again for sharing your time with us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> everything you told us has just been amazing. Yeah. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for uh, coming here to the ROM. Thanks again, David. Like we mentioned before, we took way too much of your time, so, <laughs> but we really enjoyed our chat. <laughs> and before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we'd like to remind everybody listening that we have a Patreon, and if you join it, you get exclusive access to lots of premium content, including a longer version of the interview you just listened to with David Evans, as well as the ability to request a dinosaur of the day on our Discord server and access to the Discord server. And at other levels, you can get an ad-free episode if you don't like hearing ads, as well as shout-outs, books, 
and periodic rewards when we reach certain milestones. So definitely, if you like our show and you'd like us to continue this for a long time, then consider supporting us because patrons are really what keep us going at this point. So thank you all who are already patrons and to everybody else, please consider joining. To get more information on what we offer, head over to patreon.com slash inodino and Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You probably know how to spell inodino. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Sindausaurus, which was a request from Caleb's Raptors blogs and unboxing and Dinosaur 4602. So thanks. It's <laughs> wow, a popular so one. <laughs> it was a hadrosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now China in the Jingangko Formation. And it was about 27 feet or 8.3 meters long and weighed two and a half tons. It was an herbivore. It had a dental battery and a duck bill because it's a hadrosaur. It was mostly quadrupedal, but it could rear up on two legs when it was on the lookout and needed to run away from predators or to eat. It may have lived in herds. Sindausaurus fossils were found in 1950, and then it was described in 1958 by C.C. Young, also known as Yang Zhongjian. The type species is Sindausaurus spinarinus. The name means Qingdao lizard. It's an old transliteration, which is when you transfer one letter of the alphabet of one language to the other. So in this case, of Qingdao. And Qingdao is a city, which is how they came up with the name in the first place. The species name means with a nose spine. I've got one of those. A <laughs> nose spine? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know if it qualifies as a spine. I don't think so. It's cartilage. <laughs> The holotype of Singdausaurus consists of a partial skeleton with a skull. There's a paratype that's been found, too, and that has a skull roof. It's often talked about as this unicorn-like dinosaur. So Young thought that Singdausaurus had a unicorn-like crest on its skull with a fork at the end that was about 15.7 inches or 40 centimeters long and nearly vertical from the back of the head and that the crest was hollow. That would look pretty awesome. It would. Other partial skeletons and disarticulated elements were found in the same area, and some of those Yang referred to as Singdausaurus. Others were named either Tanius chinkancoensis or Tanius lyangensis. Roch Desvensky and Taket considered Singdausaurus spinorhinus to be a junior synonym of Tanius sinensis, but not everyone agreed. In 1990, David Weishempel and Jack Horner said that the crest was not hollow and may have actually been a broken nasal bone from the top of the snout, and if Singtausaurus didn't have a distinct crest, it may have been a synonym of Tanius, which looked similar but didn't have this crest. And they thought that Singtausaurus was a chimera. Then in 1993, Eric Buftel and in 1995... Haiyan Tong Bufto found that the crest was correct, it was upright, and described a second specimen with a vertical crest, which helped show that the crest was real and Singdausaurus was distinct because of it. In 2013, Albert Prieto Marquez and Jonathan Wagner reconstructed Singtausaurus and found that the crest was the rear part of a larger head crest that started at the tip of the snout and included fused nasal bones that made a hollow tubular structure. The crest would have been mostly vertical but pointed a little to the back of the head, it may have initially looked vertical because of the way it fossilized. So it did end up looking a little bit unicorn-like. Yeah, but bigger, right? <laughs> yeah, bigger and weirder, yeah. as dinosaurs do. <laughs> <laughs> so this crest was hollow and domed. They found that the tubular structure was not an air passage and suggested that it helped make the crest less heavy. Others have thought that the nasal passage passes through the crest and it may have allowed Singtausaurus to make low-frequency noises. Sort of like the Parasaurolophus that we got to see at the ROM with David. True. <laughs> but the main part of the Singdausaurus crest hasn't been found yet, which would help clear things up. But it's also found that Singdausaurus had several distinct traits, including a round, thick rim on its upper beak. Singdausaurus is classified as a Lambiosaurine, and you can see one in Jurassic World Evolution. And our fun fact of the day is that egg pigmentation probably has an archosaurian origin. At least that's according to an article by the same title by Matthew Shockey and Liliana de Alba. And everyone does seem to agree on this, but the question is just if we can be more specific about where in archosauria colored eggs evolved. So Jasmina Wyman et al. started the ball rolling by publishing Dinosaur Egg Color Had a Single Evolutionary Origin late last year, and this was after their discovery of blue oviraptor saurian eggs back in 2017, which we covered at the time. 
But as a quick recap, because that's two years ago, <laughs> dinosaur eggs and bird eggs are colored by just two chemicals. There's protoporphyrin, which is reddish brown when it gets expressed as a color, and biliverdin, which is blue-green. Prior to the oviraptorosaurian egg discovery, since birds are the only living amniotes with colored eggs, most people assumed that birds evolved colored eggs and that dinosaurs might have just had colorless eggs. But last year, Wyman et al. ultimately concluded that colored eggs likely evolved within Eumaneraptora, which basically meant that only the subgroup of dinosaurs which eventually evolved into modern birds were the ones that had colored eggs, and none of the other egg-laying dinosaurs or egg-laying animals on land had colored eggs. So that was like a unique thing to them that they passed on to modern birds. They concluded this after doing Raman spectroscopy on quite a few different dinosaur eggs to look for signatures from the two egg pigment chemicals. But this recent article by Shockey and De Alba questioned their methods and pointed out that many white eggs contain biliverdin and protoporphyrin, including crocodiles. Gasp. <laughs> <laughs> Intrigue. But... Crocodile eggs only have protoporphyrin and not biliverdin, so some of them apparently also have biliverdin, but it doesn't apply to crocodiles. And crocodiles are an especially important one for the study because then it's not even a dinosaur that has this chemical in it. We're going way out into Archosauria, and then obviously they ended up with their conclusion that it probably had an Archosaurian origin, but not a dinosaur origin, let alone a very specific group of dinosaurs' origin. But Wyman et al. have stood by their conclusions and still think that colored eggs evolved in Eumaneraptora. I should probably mention that Eumaneraptora is like dromaeosaurs and troodontids, as well as modern birds. And the two groups are also having a whole side argument about the details of their use of Raman spectroscopy and whether or not you can infer color from these eggs that are super old. Plus, we have a whole problem of not finding all that many eggs that are from the Jurassic and Triassic, so that also makes it a lot more difficult to nail down when these colors evolved. And other than finding a colored egg outside of Eumaneraptora, it's going to be a hard debate to settle because they're both basically arguing for different levels of parsimony. One of them is trying to say we should look for these chemicals and whichever animals share those chemicals in their eggshells likely evolved colors as a common ancestor, so that's the group that thinks crocodiles might be in that group, and therefore it would be an archosaur or a pre-dinosaur relative, talking about maybe 300 million years ago. Or you can look at just the birds and dinosaurs that actually have confirmed blue-green or reddish-brown eggs, and then you end up with Eumaneraptora. So it just kind of depends on which way you look at the problem. And I, I don't really see how these groups are going to come to an agreement at this point. But it is still interesting that archosaurs are the only animals pretty much definitively on land, or I should say amniotes, that have colored eggs. So we're not going to see it outside of that group, most likely. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. Also, check out our page at patreon.com slash I know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.